pieces of evidence that satellites do exist. Satellites do exist. Okay? But there is nothing being put, with the exception of nano cube satellites, were about which are about some of them are about the size of tissue boxes. Okay? Some of them are about the size of a Rubik's Cube or something a little bit larger than a Rubik's Cube. But I'm of, of I am of the belief and understanding that there is no fucking possible way that anything weighing over a ton is being put in the nose cone of any rocket. I don't give a shit how powerful the rocket is. I've done, I put out videos, you know, um, explaining to you guys what Don Pettit, NASA astronaut and PhD, who talks about the tyranny of the rocket equation. I put this out and he explains, I don't explain it to you, but he explains how it is dumb mass, meaning extra weight and material and scientific instruments literally affects the entire performance of a particular rocket based on the amount of fuel it needs to have on board to do what it needs to do. And we all know through the national, through the Naval Research Laboratory during their rocket testing in 1954 that over a dozen rocket tests were conducted and nothing got beyond 73 miles. That's probably just under 200 kilometers, maybe about 400, 500,000 feet from the surface of the earth. But there's no way, I don't give a shit what type of physics science that they're, they're engaging in, in mathematics. There's no way they're sending something up in the sky on a rocket that weighs over a ton and allowing it to maintain its aerodynamic stability and remain control and stay and stay in control where that rocket is not spinning out of control and basically exploding in the sky. <laughs> Excuse me. So based on that hypothesis, I'm going to reveal this document to you guys to show you there ain't nothing in the fucking nose codes of those rockets. Nothing. Everything is happening on balloons. Everything as we know it. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to do my best to prove it to you. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm fucking 100% convinced of what I've been saying from day one. The entire satellite program worldwide, worldwide, okay, worldwide is a balloon program. And it's been in existence longer than fucking rockets, period. And I'm gonna show that to you. So first document we're gonna read, and here it is right here. Let me pull this bad boy up. Let me blow it up a little bit, a little bit for everybody. For those who can or cannot see it, let me go to the watch page. Let's see if everyone can see this thing. Okay, everyone can see it. So here we go. I won't be answering anything in chat. If trolls come in here and they start harassing you guys, you got to defend yourself. Do the best you can, but, you know, I'm not concerned what the fuck's going on in chat. I'll answer questions after I do the presentation. So it's more important for me to do this for you guys right now. Now, here's the document. Just like I said, it is the title of it is telling in of itself. Space and Missile Systems Center. Okay? Space and Missile Systems. Now, the term space, what does that mean? No one fucking knows what space really means, what it's defined as. Okay? They, they have a general international presumption of where space begins. The U.S. Department of Defense classifies and, and categorizes space to begin at 80 kilometers. That's about 262,000 plus feet above the surface, center surface of the Earth. That means the flat plane surface that we live on, you launch a rocket, boom, 262,000 plus feet above the surface of the Earth. That's U.S. DOD standard. So... According to the DOD, they got aircraft that could fly close to that, maybe half the distance. But the international standard is called what they call the Kármán line. Theodor von Kármán developed him and a bunch of physicists and scientists from all over the world, including scientists from the United States, established in the 1940s 
that space actually begins at 100 kilometers. For those in the United States, that converts to 328,082 328,082 feet above the surface of the earth, okay? That is where actual space begins. Now, what is space? We can, we can have several definitions of what space is. We don't fucking know. They're still studying it as we speak. So space definitely, that at that altitude, even at DOD standard, we got a serious lack of oxygen and all of the components and pressure and environments that are consistent on the surface plane of the earth. Okay, so in space, you have limited to almost zero aerodynamic control, astronomic control. You need some sort of vehicle that has to travel at ultra high speeds beyond, well beyond the speed of sound, which is 700 and I think 60 miles per hour. Okay, it has to be traveling at high speed, you know, for it to maintain any sort of aerodynamic stability and function and control at those altitudes. So what is space? I have no fucking idea. They're still trying to figure it out, so I'm definitely not going to open up Pandora's box to get criticized for that. So Space and Missile Systems Center. This is an interview with Lieutenant Colonel Harold E. Mitchell for the Corona Program. Now, let me dive in about the Corona Program. The Corona Program, okay, the Corona Program is still a top secret program. It was a program launched by the National Reconnaissance Office, okay, in conjunction with the CIA. It's supposed to, it, it's equipped with some very advanced optical equipment and photographic equipment to conduct mapping and, and reconnaissance uh, intelligence gathering capabilities, okay? So I have that document pulled up here for you guys that we're going to reference. We're going to need that program. So this is a letter actually drafted. Uh, August 21st, 1964, regarding a corona mission. Now, I need you to understand this. There were several corona missions. So this is the importance behind proving that this satellite was never launched on a fucking rocket. Okay? They had several missions. This satellite was put up on a gondola balloon it did its thing for however many days or months, and then it was captured by a C-119 multi-engine turboprop U.S. Air Force cargo plane, specially outfitted to capture this thing on a, to capture it using some sort of tail hook type of device, okay? So I'm not gonna read this entire document, but there's specific sections of this document we're going to address so I can prove to you guys that satellites are not floating around above a hundred and maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand feet. They are literally ten to maybe fifty thousand feet above the altitude where you two optimal flight range is. So, and I'll show that to you as well. The technical specs for you two. They can go beyond 70,000 feet, okay? Beyond 70,000 feet. That's not their max operating altitude. They can go beyond that, okay? Now, the reason why I chose this document is for one simple reason, okay? Although this activity occurred between 1954 and 1956, and Corona program is 1958 to 1962, the subject time frame involves about 20 years, 23, 23 years, Okay, but look at the date of the interview, people. The date of the interview was October 1st of 2003. Okay, now, what significant does that play? One, it's, to me, it's fairly recent. Even though this is 2016, that's 13 years, okay? This, re this document was recently declassified as an interview, but it's also interesting to note that it was conducted by the Space and Missile Systems Center. All right, all right, so let's go on. This is the document I downloaded from the National Reconnaissance Office. I put the link inside the description section. Anybody can click on that and read it. If you want to go along while we're reading this, please do that. click on the link, open up the document in PDF, go along with me on this so you can, you can help me out if I develop some sort of confirmation bias or, or I, get an, I get an episode of, of the Mandela effect while I'm reading it, okay? 
I don't want you guys to think that I'm being, you know, biased on this whole thing. I'm being very open to it, okay? So Robert McCulley was the, uh, of the history office at the Space and Missile Centers at Los Angeles Air Force Base. He said, today is a, uh, stand by here for a second, people. I've got some, uh, some little one. Uh, I got a little one who's getting a little difficult. So excuse me for that. I can't control that. My wife is taking care of it. And, um, you know, that's what you have when you have a two-year-old and terrible twos. So this guy is going to interview Lieutenant Colonel Harold E. Mitchell of Missouri over the telephone about his experiences recovering Corona satellites. That's crazy because I've been conducting telephone interviews, guys, and I know that there are a lot of you out there that love these telephone interviews, and I'm going to fucking keep them going. I'm going to keep these things flowing with these telephone interviews. This guy conducted it over telephone, and here's what was said. Okay. The first couple of pages of this, he just basically is asking the guy about his background. Why this guy in 2003 didn't fly to this guy and do the interview in person is beyond me, okay? I don't know why he didn't fly to go to this guy. Maybe being over the telephone was better, but, you know, who knows? I'm not going to get into that issue, but let's, let's go over this right here. All right, I'm going to skip forward because he just talks about the guy's history where he got his training, how long he's been doing his training. You know, this is just basically, you know, uh, introductory type of, okay, this is who this guy is. I need to know who he is. Let's, okay, now let's get to the meat of what, what it is he was doing and what his role was in this program, okay? So they talk about what his rank was. This guy was a captain, okay? He was in charge in 1954. He was part of the Dragnet program, also known as the Genetrix program or weapons system, 119L came along okay they were flying out of charleston Car charleston south carolina that's where they were doing a lot of their training all right they were flying a c-119 you saw a brief picture of what that looks like it says how did you conduct your training to talk about how they were conducting their training again a lot of this information it's not insignificant but it just adds to the narrative of you know is he talking to the right guy all right so Going on and on, they talk about the capabilities. The similarly, recovery packages were dropped from a C-119 flying at higher altitude, 15 to 16,000 feet. The training plane circling below at 12,000 feet. So they're just, you know, they're, they're at safe altitudes to conduct this training. Yeah, no harm, no foul. You know, it's just, just standard how they do their training. All right, so let me get let me get to the meter here, what he's asking this guy, okay? Um, all right, so here's some of the, the beginning meat of this interview. Macaulay asked Mitchell, Captain Mitchell, did you ever recover the dragnet training capsules at night? Mitchell says, at night. It's impossible to recover at night. The only time we flew at night was during our instrument training. We didn't fly our emergency training at night either. We did all of our training instrument flying 16 hours a day. We did that because time was of the essence. And if we didn't fly night missions, We'd never get all the training done to get people ready to go into the practice sessions, okay? So let's go ahead and. Now, here's where he describes what the dragnet gondola looked like. What did, the, what did a dragnet gondola look like? Well, we use similar parachutes except the Corona program or Discoverer program only used one chute, okay? We used four 28 parachutes, 28 foot parachutes for a dragnet gondola and they did all of the chute modification at the parachute shop. They would attach four parachutes, and then and and these were not reinforced parachutes. They were just to lower the load, the gondola. And um, you'd attach them to the gondola, and then from the middle of this, on a longer tether, you would have a smaller chute that we call the drogue chute. I think the drogue chute was 100 feet above the four descent chutes, and the drogue chute was reinforced. We can make our passes on that drogue chute, okay? When they say they can make their passes on that drogue chute, you're looking at a 100-foot tether, right? And what would happen is that the drogue chute would deploy. You got a 100-foot of tether. The plane didn't need to come within a, a, a dangerous distance of the chute as the as the, 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 the satellite was falling from the sky and they'd be able, they'd have a hook at the back of the aircraft that would fly by and hook this chute. And once they hooked it, 
they start reeling it into the back of the aircraft okay if anybody's ever seen that um, if you can find a video online right now help me out here a little bit to show what that looks like please do post it up and um, we can I can show everybody what that looks like okay so here's some important data the top of the gondola the top of the gondola had a compartment for the chutes and all that stuff and a lot of it had to be the parachutes but the whole capsule was 1450 pounds when it was airlifted okay the capsule they're talking about is literally the satellite the gondola had a, now I want you to pay attention to this he says he's, he's this is Mitchell Captain Mitchell talking Captain Mitchell says the gondola had a huge balloon I mean a huge balloon you could see it at 60,000 to 85,000 feet, okay? That's what he says. Not only does he describe the balloon, but he's, he accentuates how big the balloon actually was. Now, this supports what I've been telling all of you, that NASA has had a balloon program literally for decades, decades, over, as long as they've been in existence. Some of these balloons are the size of a football field. And if you, I don't care if, if you could use the word football as in soccer or American football or rugby. When you look at the size of a football field, 100 yards long, 50 yards wide, just imagine what that looks like up in the sky. Think about what a balloon that size could lift off the ground. Okay? Now, Macaulay says, did you ever see a Genetrix balloon get inflated and then lift off? Did you see that process? Mitchell says, one. Mitchell says once, but I didn't see the beginning of it. I saw it when it was about three quarters filled and then the liftoff. Now, this was only in the training phase of our operation in the summer of 1955, and that was done in Denver, Colorado at Lowry Air Force Base. The one that I watched launch, they had to put the capsule on a forklift, and I imagine this was done before the balloon was attached and inflated. At any rate, they started their inflation and then as the balloon got full enough to support itself and go airborne they'd run down a taxiway with the forklift carrying the gondola until the balloon had enough lift to get the gondola airborne now i want to show all of you what that actually looks like in real time now when i say real time okay when i say real time i'm talking to you this is a launch that had already occurred in antarctica Okay, this is a launch that already occurred in Antarctica, and I'm going to show it to you. No, that's not, that's not the one I want to show you. That is not the one I want to show you. I want to. Sh There's one that I do want to show you. Yeah, bear with me here for a second, people, because it was a minute long, and I forgot to put the link in the description section. So um, just stand by here for a second. Bear with me. I don't want to make these presentations too long. I want to give you a month here. Stand by. Okay, here we go. This is the, what I want. What I just read to you. And here we go. This is, I just read this to you. This balloon launch took place in Antarctica, and it's an 8,000 fucking pound telescope satellite. There goes the mountains in the background. Here's a visual description of what I just read in that document. On a taxiway and getting it aloft and launching it. Watch what happens. If you like apples, how you like them fucking apples? That's 8,000 fucking pounds, people. 8,000 pounds. That dome on the top, that dome on the top is actually where all of the radio equipment is installed so that the C-130, so that a C-130 can communicate with it. It sends off a signal 
so that when these aircraft are in the air, they can detect the signal why it's up at 85,000 feet, 100,000 feet. Today's balloons get to about 130, 150, 180,000 feet, okay? And at nighttime, when the helium air is cooled down, the, 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 the balloon drops in altitude about 10,000 feet, maybe 5,000 feet. And then when the sun shines back up on it again, that hot helium air expands in the balloon, raises in altitude again. So you have this oscillation of losing altitude, gaining altitude, losing altitude, gaining altitude. Now, for anybody that hasn't paid close attention to what the ISS is doing, the ISS is doing the same fucking thing that balloons do. And I'm going to prove that to you as well, that the ISS, if it exists, which now I'm of the, of the notion, conclusion, that it does exist, that means that the ISS is up in the sky. It's not at 245 miles. It's within, say, 150, maybe 250,000 feet. And it's oscillating just like these fucking balloons. Okay? And to prove to you where that site location is, this is Google Earth Pro. This is December 15th of 2009, okay? This is Antarctica. Antarctica people. On the other side of Antarctica, so do this. I've shown this before on another channel. This is the launch site for the balloons. It's called the Wallop Program, all right? The Wallop program based on satellite imagery okay you have these large cranes out there okay the launch site for the balloons further proof that they're using aircraft to capture these things down in Antarctica this here goes your C-130s C7, these are your C-130s. These are your C-119s. Sober prop planes. And if anybody wants to say, oh, well, they're using this to transport people back and forth. Yeah, they are using people to transport back and forth. But guess what? These are also specially outfitted aircraft to literally recover. When, the, when they pop, when they intentionally burst the balloon, it comes down on a drone chute, a drogue chute, and these aircraft fly at, at uh, 20, 30,000 feet, and they go and grab this fucking thing. Aircraft right there. There's your aircraft. Five. You have a sixth over here. This is for crew transportation. But these big boys right here, these Hercules, these Hercules are the ones that are recovering 8,000 pound fucking satellites. 8,000 pound telescope satellites launched from Antarctica. The document. Because this document gets better. Now, Macaulay says, did the gondola lift off pretty quickly after it was inflated? Mitchell says, yeah. Once it was inflated with the helium it carried, that balloon was designed to go during the day to about 85,000 feet. Now, this is back in 1954, people. Today's balloons get, well, almost three times this altitude, okay? Maybe two and a half times. And as nighttime came and the gas cooled down, it would come down to around 60,000 feet to 65,000 feet. So it went, it dropped almost 20,000 feet in altitude in the evening time, okay? In the evening time. So I want you guys to picture this, okay? There are people online um, who they they're so in love with NASA they will tell us all these trolls will say no I've seen satellites myself they'll say no I've seen satellites myself I've seen it in my telescope I've seen the Hubble I've seen the space station I've seen a satellite pass over okay I'm gonna agree you saw the Hubble you saw the ISS you saw whatever satellite they might have put in orbit but guess what it's not in fucking space because space is classified and defined at 262,000 feet and the international line is 328,000 feet. So there ain't no fucking way you're looking at anything at fucking 200,000 feet. You're looking at the Hubble and the ISS 
floating around in the fucking thermosphere, moving at high speeds because the hot air up there moves at high speeds, very high speeds. How fast the speeds are, who knows? But we know, we know this for a fact. The higher you go, the faster you have to go, right? The higher you go, the faster you have to go if you're using an aerodynamic vehicle, okay? That airplane has to be aerodynamically structured and sound and built so that it matches what NASA calls the linear aircraft model, right? You got to be flying at high speeds beyond the speed of sound. But with the situation with balloons, this guy actually describes how some balloons got caught up in the jet stream back in 1954 and they lost fucking track of them. They just flew away to another country. He describes that. So if the Hubble is up there, it didn't launch on April 24th, 1990 in the fucking space shuttle weighing 27 fucking thousand pounds. Okay. It was launched just like you saw that 8,000 pound satellite, which was literally probably about two thirds the size of the Hubble and was launched on a balloon. Period. Now, Macaulay says, do you know how long the balloon floated over the U.S. before they were usually recovered? Mitchell says it varied with the flight path. We tried to recover them before they left the continental limits of the United States. We had one balloon that went into the jet stream and flew east during our training period. I believe that it took off in July 1955. We deployed an airplane and he went to Goose Bay, Newfoundland, refueled and headed for the Azores. I believe there was an, there were an, one another one or two airplanes from other other squadrons too. He says the balloon was finally terminated someplace over the area of the Azores. I don't think that capsule was ever recovered. I couldn't say for sure. Macaulay says recovering a discovery parachute must have been easy compared to the to a dangerous gondola. Mitchell says it was. Discovery was much easier once we resolved the problems and they designed the right parachute and equipment to recover it with. Actually, when you do area recovery every day, it's a piece of cake. Easy. It was fun. Each recovery aircrew had to airily recover five dragnet parachutes after we'd complete our area recovery phase. We went up to an airfield at Georgetown, South Carolina. Ground crews would use drums of water to simulate the gondolas for surface recovery. Okay? Let's go on here. So... Let me see here. Uh, they're talking about how they lost a crew. Um, let me see here. They talk about how they had an airborne security team, but there's something else interesting here I want to show you guys. Um, oh, look what he says here. He says, during the genetics program, we operated under the Strategic Air Command. To show you how important genetics was to the Strategic Air Command, we, pilot, we pilots each carried a letter in our, in, our, in our secret folder along with our top secret aircraft equipment. It was a letter from the Director of Operations for Headquarters, SAC, his name was Brigadier General Howard Smith, to the commander of any SAC base where we had to land that we had the number one priority over anything else in refueling, maintenance, and getting our aircraft back airborne. Now, why would they have number one priority to refuel and get airborne again? Let's, let's, let's assess that. Well, if there's hundreds or thousands of fucking these satellites supposedly in space floating around, and we know now they were fucking balloons, and these things suffer some sort of malfunction and they come down. That airplane has got to go to that location to recover that thing so it doesn't fall down on somebody's fucking house or in their fucking backyard. That's what it comes down to. These airplanes had to be available nonstop to go anywhere at any time to recover this thing. And it had to be recovered once they got notification, hey, the balloon just popped. Drogue shoot, we need an aircraft up in the air immediately, okay? But I'm going to show you how, I'm going to show you proof that they couldn't get to one of these aircraft fast enough. They couldn't get to one of these satellites fast enough, and it actually crashed somewhere in a foreign country, 
and I'm going to read that document to you or what happened to it. Okay. So he says, you had a terrible time getting refuel maintenance or anything just to get out. On the way to California on that particular trip, I had to go from Greenville and refuel at Salina, Kansas, Smoky Hill. So let's go on here. Let me see here. And he's talking about some of the mission operations, um, standing orders. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Here's where they talk about getting in contact with one of the balloons. I then flew into Castle Air Force Base on Friday night. The next morning, we checked into the command post. The balloon had started traveling to the west, and they were concerned about it. So they scrambled us, and we started tracking after it. Each one of these balloons transmitted their own identification signal. By the time we made contact with the balloon, we were about 310 miles at sea, west of San Francisco. I didn't like us being out there by ourselves, especially making aerial recovery. At about 85,000 feet, after you sighted a balloon, you'd interrogate it. What they mean by interrogate is you do an inspection to see what's going on here. It could be some sort of decoy. Um, the Russians used to do this. They used to drop, they used to do the same thing, drop shit out of the sky, making it and 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 spoofing the signal to to basically spy on areas in the United States and they'd send these aircraft out there. The U.S. would send their aircraft out and they'd have to inspect it to see what was really going on, if it was really their equipment or somebody else's equipment. And let me tell you what the Russians used to do, okay? They would, they would launch a decoy and when an aircraft got close enough to it and it was transmitting that signal and that aircraft got close, they'd fucking detonate the thing and it'd explode in the fucking air. That was your warfare there. That was your space Star Wars program. Star Wars program considered fucking using balloons and, and as bombs, basically. The balloon's radio signal would give, give you its code name or code number. If you wanted to terminate its flight, you had a black box up on the flight deck at the navigator station. He would dial in the code of the balloon we were trying to track, and the balloon would come back and answer. Then if we had clearance from the Charleston Air Force Base command post to bring the balloon down, we would insert another code. This then would ignite a blast from the gondola that would burst the balloon. After we terminated the flight of the balloon, here's what they say. It would do very much the same as the discoverer did. It would fall so far and then the drogue chute would come out. The chute would slow it down until it was at an acceptable altitude and airspeed. And then the parachute would get fully deployed. It was late, listen to this people, it was late in the evening when they authorized me to terminate the balloon. Now, how late in the evening could it be? We could be maybe when, you know, maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night, 11. It could be in the middle of the night when they, when they would authorize these balloons. Hey, go pop this bad boy. We don't want nobody seeing it. You need to go bring it down so that we could go send up another one later. Where would they send up another one? You'll see. I'll read off to you the countries in this document that they actually were launching these programs from. Okay. Macaulay says, once you recovered this gondola, what happened to it at that point? Mitchell says, we made the recovery on it, brought it back in. We were very low on fuel. I told them I was going to Castle Air Force, or Air Force Base to refuel. Then they deployed us to Ophid Air Force Base, Nebraska, where we delivered the capsule there. Where it gets interesting for me. After you, Macaulay says, after you landed at Ophid Air Force Base, to drop the gondola off, how did they unload it and take it away? Mitchell says they sent people out and it was offloaded. Where they took it to and what they did with it afterwards, we didn't know. That was not our mission. Dragnet was a top secret operation, gondola and all. The only thing that we were concerned with were the people who were not connected with the program, that they had no opportunity to see the gondola, so we carried sidearms. You hear that? They didn't want people to see this thing. So they, they were always strapped, ready to go, that if someone were to see one of these things, they had to deal with that person. You're not supposed to see these fucking satellites launched on fucking balloons. You're not supposed to see them land. You're not supposed to see them being offloaded. Now, this was back in 1954. You bet your ass the same thing is happening today. They don't want nobody seeing the Hubble come down on a fucking parachute. They don't want to see it. They don't want to see 
parts of the space station, which is in modules, detach, come down on a fucking drogue parachute, get captured by one of these, these C-119s or C-130s, taken down to Antarctica at the Concordia station. And just to remind people and to redress this, Concordia station, NASA classifies it as a hypoxic environment. Okay? They said the conditions at Concordia are more severe than being on the ISS. It's extremely fucking cold down there. So when astronauts, astronauts actually are sent down there for cold weather training in the most extreme environment on Earth. They said it's more extreme than being at altitude. And it dawned on me now, when I read the, got that document a couple of months ago, I started to put two and two together. How could there be a place on the surface of the flat plain Earth? How could there be a place at about 8,000 feet above sea level be more extreme than being at 245 fucking miles above the surface of the Earth, supposedly in microgravity? And I thought to myself, wait a minute. The ISS is definitely fucking not at 245 miles because if I can go to Concordia Station in Antarctica and literally be in worse conditions than being on ISS, then ISS conclusively has to be around 150, 160,000 feet on a fucking balloon. Let's keep going on. So this guy goes on and he says that, and this is what's interesting about this. He says he, he had an instrument problem on the airplane at Ofer Air Force Base and the people came out to refuel the plane. I filed back, I filed to come back to Charleston as soon as they offloaded the gondola. This was on a Sunday morning and I'd gotten in there late Saturday night. The base operations officer said he was going to come aboard. He wanted to check form 21A, which is my maintenance form. I lost in an in inverter and I had a bad generator, but I didn't want to fool around and stay at Offutt Air Force Base on a weekend trying to get it repaired. So while this guy's at this base, this captain, okay, some lieutenant colonel, he says he was a lieutenant colonel, and he tried to come on board our airplane, and here's what happened. The captain, Mitchell, says, he says, I said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed on board. This lieutenant colonel stepped up the ladder and started explaining that he was a silver leaf, a lieutenant colonel, and I was wearing tracks, a captain. About that time, he heard the rifle bolt of a carbine, carbine slide home, load its ammunition. My crew chief was standing there with his carbine down at his hip, so that the lieutenant colonel, so the lieutenant colonel decided not to come on board. He decided prudence was better, part of valor. So you see that. This guy's a captain. He tells a lieutenant colonel, sir, I'm sorry, you can't come on board. I'll come down to show you my form 21A, but you can't come on board. This lieutenant colonel says, excuse me, but I'm a lieutenant colonel and you're a captain. I can come on board. And one of this guy's crew chief says, I don't think so. He chambered around. Lieutenant colonel said that and he's like, okay, no harm, no foul. Uh, let me know when you come down and show me the form. I mean, come on, people. You're talking about an Air Force pilot, top secret security clearance, maybe higher, and they got authorization to kill one of their own people if security is breached. This guy's not even supposed to know what the hell is inside that aircraft. They were ready to shoot him. That's what you got to deal with. So, and Macaulay says, did the Genetrix gondola drop a capsule like the Discoverer did? Mitchell says, no, the gondola hung below the four 27-foot, 24-foot chutes. When you shoot the balloon down, all these parachutes packed on the top of the gondola deployed. The gondola will start then falling to the earth. He says, so, you recovered the entire gondola. He says, you caught the whole thing. You caught everything except the balloon, and it was quite a load. Error recovery really was kind of a hairy operation because you're flying at such low speeds. We were especially low on fuel that night. We had to fly at, a, at about 115, 115 
to 120 knots just to keep our airspeed up. And with the beaver tail door open and the recovery poles and cables hanging out of the back of the end of the airplane, it took quite a bit of power using quite a bit of fuel. So again, these guys are recovering things that are thousands of pounds, half a ton, a ton or more. They have to fly at low speeds just to capture the damn thing and make sure they don't rip the tether apart and lose the damn satellite. So once they capture it, they got to start reeling it in and they got to maintain altitude and power, which uses up a lot of fuel just to stay in flight. And then they beat feet out of it and get the hell out of it and take it to where it needs to go. All right. Here, there's another section, Gentrex. I want to take you to the part where they talk about U2, the U2 program. Because this also is proof to support what I've been saying about the U2 program being the replacement for the U.S. satellite program. Okay? The U.S. satellite program. Right, let me see here. Okay. So here, here's some descriptions of where they actually have these aircraft launching these balloons. He says, once our genetics training was completed and the airplanes were put in top maintenance condition, we deployed to our pre-designated bases in November of 1955. We had three squadrons in the 456 TCW and they split each squ squadron right down the middle into six detachments. Our squadron, we were the 746 troop carrier squadron and our detachment was deployed to Kodiak, Alaska. The 745th Squadron went to ADAC, Naval Air Station, Alaska, and the other detachment was sent to Japan at Johnson, Misawa, Itaziku. Another squadron was sent to Kadena, Kadena, Okinawa. Our headquarters was just was at Johnson Air Force Base. They had these everywhere, people. They had them in Germany. They had them in Sweden. All right. They even had some in Russia. Russia. So let me see here. I'm going to take you to the part where they talk about the U-2 program, how U-2 actually replaced them. Let me see here. Okay, here we go. They said that night the winds got up to, this is when they were in Alaska, he says the, the, the winds got up to 100 miles an hour. It sandblasted the airplane, absolutely sandblasted the paint off of it. About the 1st of April, <coughs> the U-2 started flying, so our missions were over about the 1st of April, 1956, okay? I'm going to show you Lockheed's site so we can look at U2 and do a little brief technical descriptive analysis of U2. Macaulay says, when you were flying out, out there looking for gondolas, were you both visually looking for them and listening to your radios for their signals? Mitchell says, we were doing both. In Alaska, the daylight hours are pretty short in wintertime. So they would give us the codes of the balloons that were flying in our area. The navigator would continually monitor the different codes with the ADF, the Air Direction Finder Radio. The balloons had ADF beacons that we could come, come home in on. Each balloon had its own frequency. We would sit there and the navigator would keep scanning these different frequencies that we would get for that particular mission. Now, think about this, people. You have amateur radio operators out there all around the world who says that they can track the signals from satellite communications. Now, I'm not doubting they, can't, they can track satellite communication signals. But let's be clear. What we've all been led to believe what a satellite is is something that is so far advanced and technically incredible that it's floating around up there on its own. We see these on videos. We see this on television. Oh, look at this satellite. But when we go to NASA, we never see a real-time fucking picture of one of these fucking things. It's always a CGI photo or video or some sort of artist rendition of what the satellite looks like. It's a fucking drawing. It's a color-by-numbers fucking drawing of what the satellite's supposed to look like. Every single video we've all ever seen, they're all CGI videos and images of satellites. They never show you the fucking thing in real time. Why can't they show it in real time? Because it's not where they say it is. But what is up there is a real satellite, but it's not at the altitude they claim it is. It is giving off a frequency and signature. It is floating in the sky, but not unaided. 
It's on a fucking 100 foot or more tethered balloon. You only see it at night. And when you see it, it's, it's the moonlight or the sunlight reflecting off of this. Now I know why these, why these satellites have to have these gold and, and aluminum reflective surfaces. Because they are maintaining the lie, fraud, illusion. Oh, look at the satellite up in the sky. You see the sun reflect off of it? There it is. But you don't see the tether. You don't see this dark colored black fucking balloon floating in the nighttime sky. I'm going to show you guys a picture of the color of this balloon. And you tell me, you, there's no fucking way you'd be able to see this. And it's interesting that they fly these balloons at times and fly them on trajectories where they'd never come in front of the fucking moon at night, at a full moon. Because then you'd be able to see the tether. You never see them in the daytime. They're using, they're at high altitudes where you can't see them. You can't even see the satellite because it's, it's also a specific color where you can't see that color at high altitudes. You can't see a white painted or silver colored fucking satellite in the daytime. Because one, you got the sunlight deep in your eyes, clouding your view, fucking with your view. They know this. They're using our lack of ocular acuity to distort our visions to say, ah, there's no fucking way people will look up in the sky looking for one of our satellites floating on a balloon. We've been showing them video for 75 years that the, all these things go up on rockets. Bullshit. Nothing goes up on a fucking rocket. There's nothing in the nose cone of that fucking rocket. Period. Period. They all crash in the fucking ocean. So here's what the guy says. About how many balloons would you be looking for at one time? Mitchell says the number would depend on the balloons identified in a daily mission. Frag order. Fragmentary operations order. Their codes would be listed. So each one of these balloons has a frequency and a code. These guys go up in there. They probably got maybe 50, 100 of these things they need to track during their mission flight plan. So let's just say a C-130 can fly 30, 3,500, maybe 4,000 nautical miles. They can be up there for maybe four or five hours. They work in shifts. Okay. So within that four or five hour period, they're tracking things that are up there. They're sending signals back and forth. They may be also downloading data and imagery. Okay. They may also be downloading data and imagery from these satellites on balloons and they're download and the, and the planes are actually transmitting that data to ground stations on the ground so then that data can be processed. Okay? That's how it's happening people. That's the satellite program. That's why every military is always conducting flight operations and flight training. They're not training operations. They're Training operations disguised as real fucking satellite recovery, data transmission, and data recovery missions. That's what they are. When you, this military aircraft in the fucking air 27 fucking, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all over the world, period. Here's what this guy's saying. As I say on occasion, we heard them, but we couldn't spot them. It was our thinking that, pos and the reason why they couldn't spot them because Look where these, these aircraft are flying. Their max altitude of a C-130 is maybe about uh, 45,000 feet. Maybe some can go to 50,000 feet. When they do their, their air refueling, they're at high altitude. So these balloons are actually floating almost maybe 50, 60, 70,000 feet above where they can see. So, of course, they can't see it. They would need to wait for it to start dropping down to anywhere between 30, 15 to 30,000 feet. Then they can spot the fucking thing because they'll see the drone shoots deploy. This guy's saying, I think it was 10,000 feet the beacons would, would continue to function. We, can, we thought that, that they went down and were in the snow in the Brooks Range or, or some of the other mountains up in Alaska. He says, did your unit tell, the, tell you the purpose or the mission of the genetics while you were doing this? He says, yeah, we knew. The balloons were launched from Norway. Look at this, people. The balloons were, were launched from Norway, Denmark, West Germany, and I think some from Turkey. In the winter, February of 1956, there was an article in Time magazine about the Russians complaining about our overflight of the Soviet Union with these balloons. Holy shit, people. I mean, really. 
The Russians were complaining about the U.S. flying over the Soviet Union with balloons. If you go back to fucking CIA declassified reports, CIA declassified reports, the CIA unequivocally says that they were fucking conducting satellite fucking imagery of Russian fucking troop movements, missile launches, facility development, and here it is, we find out from Mr. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Mitchell, the Russians would complain about overflights of, of the Soviet Union with balloons. They had any number of gondolas stacked in the Sperodonska Palace driveway of foreign ministry, Molotov. It was just unbelievable. He had many of them. What they're describing here is this. The Soviets ended up capturing a shitload of these fucking balloons the U.S. was sending up in the air. And they would literally send their aircraft up to capture them and bring them down. Now, you got to think about this, people. <laughs> this is fucking incredible. This is absolutely mind-blowing. You're trying to tell me that we've been spending trillions of fucking dollars for over 60 years for a fucking satellite program they claim is going up on a rocket and it's just a fucking balloon you can buy from a fucking hobby shop? Oh my God. This is incredible. An interesting fact, the airplane I flew during the Corona program had many recoveries of balloons than any airplane in the 456 wing. It was flown by Captain Slaughter Mims. And I think Slaughter recovered three balloons near Japan. He got more than anyone else. Slaughter had a lot of success. And he's describing the same aircraft that this guy flew. Okay? And they're talking about how perfect the airplane was. Let me see here. Where else? Where else? They, they said some interesting stuff here. Talking about the load masters. Okay. Here you go. This guy, Macaulay, says, how, sex, how successful was the Genetrix program? Mitchell says, none of the pilots associated with the project was ever permitted to see any of the genetic film that was recovered. The film was stored in the vaults at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base, the last I heard. I was at Air University Film Library in 1957, and I asked if I could see the film, but they wouldn't let me because I didn't have need to know about it. Outwardly, I understood that, this, that it was a fair success. We knew more about the Russians than we would have without Genetrix. It wasn't but it wasn't good enough to continue with in the conjunction with the U-2. It was like the U-2 wasn't as good as Discoverer. I have a document and a study on genetics done by a gentleman up in Minnesota. It gives the number that was recovered. A lot of the gondolas went into the water and were never recovered. They had a saltwater plug in them that dissolved when the plug came in contact with the water and eventually sank the gondola. That's what they say. That's what they say. Now, get this. Macaulay says, did the public ever see the Genetrix gondolas and, and think they were UFOs? Mitchell says, I never heard of any reports of that nature, if there were any. There could be, there could have been. I don't know. You know, it's been so long since that operation, I don't recall any newspapers that might have said that they were UFOs. I know you could see the balloon. Listen to what he says. He says, I know you could, you could see the balloon very easily from the ground. It looked, here you go, people, smoking gun. It looked about like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. You see this for yourself, people. He said it looked, you could see it from the ground, and it looked like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. So for all those naysayers out there that claim they've seen the Hubble, They've seen the ISS. They've seen other satellites and shit floating around in the sky. Think about this. That reflection that you see with the sun reflecting off of the aluminum surface or whatever type of aluminum, whatever type of shiny reflective material they're using for these satellites, you're not seeing the 100 foot or more tether attached to a goddamn fucking balloon the size of a football field up in the thermosphere, potentially. Carried by the jet stream, 
flying around a specific territory that is tasked to fly around in. They said it plain as day. There it is right there. It looked about like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. Macaulay says, at that time, did you normally call the program Dragnet or Genetrix? Mitchell says, we called it Dragnet. Genetrix was a classified code name for the program like Corona and Discoverer. Dr. Alvin H. Howell was the brains behind the balloon program. There you go. So this document goes on and on and on. He talks about a whole bunch of other shit after that. But what I want to show you is this. Here is, let me, let me bring this to you. They lost one of these, okay? They lost one of the corona satellites on a balloon, okay? This is a letter written to the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at the National Reconnaissance Office, okay? This was released, declassified and released by the National Reconnaissance Office November 26 of 1997 in accordance with executive order, I think that's 12958, okay? No, I don't want anybody to freak out seeing that this is a secret document. It's already been declassified. It was sent for a memorandum to the Director of Central Intelligence. Now, I want you to see this. This is interesting, very interesting, because look what they say. Subject, Corona Mission 1005 Incident. This memorandum is for, the, for information only. Corona Mission 1005 was launched on 27 April into orbit. Orbit? Orbit fucking where? It was, they're considering orbit to be space. We know it ain't fucking space, all right? But that's moved. Let's continue on. Recovery attempts commencing to May were unsuccessful. Attached here to is a chronology of operational reporting received on this mission. Number three, on August 5th, OSA received word from its security representative at the Air Force Base, Los Angeles, that a satellite capsule had been reported as coming down near the Venezuelan-Colombia border. The actions taken by OSA upon receipt of this information are detailed in a separate attachment. As a result of the investigation by the OSA in conjunction with the Caracas station and the embassy attache office there, the following facts are noted. Listen to this. August 1st. First word was received by Caracas Army Attaché Office of finding of a capsule at La Fria, 500 miles southwest of Caracas in a remote region of the Andes. August 3rd, reconfirmation of capsule finding made by telephone call to Caracas Embassy. August 4th, representatives of the embassy viewed capsule at San Cristobal to which it had been moved by political police. First press stories appeared, okay? And the Venezuelans didn't play any games. Down here in Latin America, the U.S. does some crazy shit. They publicize this shit. They don't keep that shit secret. August 5th, capsule flown by host government to Caracas. August 6th to the 10th, capsule held by Minister of Defense of Venezuela. All right? August 8th, team from headquarters arrived at Caracas consisting of a security officer and a technical officer from the OSA office and a technical officer from the National Reconnaissance Office. August 10th, Capsule turned over to embassy, examined, and reports made by the headquarters team. Copies of pertinent cables on technical and security aspects attached. August 12th, security officer scheduled to return capsule to West Coast. August 6th to the 12th. For the record, it should be noted that on Thursday, 6th August, a request was made by the CIA to the NRO to convene a meeting of the Interdepartmental Contingency Planning Committee to assess the problems coordinate procedures and assign responsibility for responding to any news media queries which might arise. Now, what's interesting about this, when the Venezuelans got this fucking thing, they noticed there was a label, that, that, that there was a, a secret um, label on the fucking satellite. It was marked secret. And they removed that fucking classification from it. They removed that classification from it. Okay, so that's a letter. There's a lot of documentation here that um, I'll put this in my um, cloud file so those who can see it. I actually put a, I think I put a link for it. I don't think I put it in there yet. But I want to go back to this because 
This is regarding the history of satellite reconnaissance, volume 2A, Samos. Remember that name, Samos, okay? The Samos satellite, because here's what I'm going to take you to next. This is the list of all balloon launches from the Isranj Space Center in Sweden, okay? Now, let me take you. Let me take you to the Swedish Space Center. And here is the Swedish Space Center website. It's in the description section of this live chat session. This is the Swedish Space Center. And as you can see, they have balloons and rockets, payloads. This is their website. This is their website. Swedish. The Swedes, okay? It's the Swedes. Here's their space center. They do balloon launches. Now, let me take you the document I downloaded from their website. Now, this is a list of balloon launches from the Astron Space Center starting December 9th of 1982. Remember that term, Samos? Okay. Here we go. History of satellite reconnaissance, right? This was declassified May 7th of 2012. All right? These flights took place uh, somewhere between 63, 65, 72. But again, I don't get too focused on the date and time frames. I just want you to see how long these programs have been in existence. Okay? I want you to see how long these programs have been in existence. You can read these documents for yourselves. We don't need to keep going through all this stuff together. I put a lot of this shit out for you people so that you can see this. You see they talk about weather satellite program, mapping satellite program, realignment controversy, new directions in satellite reconnaissance, okay? But let me take you to this document, which is very important from the Swedes. This is not U.S.-oriented. I got this from a foreign country, okay? So you look at some of the launches. These, these are balloon launches, people. These ain't fucking rockets. It says it. List of balloon launches. So I want to go down this list, and I want you guys to see something very, very fucking interesting. It may shock a shitload of you. It should shock fucking all of you. It didn't shock me because I've been known about this program for a long time. Okay? And I want you to see something important. There's going to be some things here that you may see that are going to catch your eye. All right? Because I want you to look. You see the campaign, you look at the payload. All right? You got campaigns and payloads. And we're not going to go through all these codes, but you're going to see something that's going to catch your attention. All right? We're going to keep going through this. All right? Keep going through it. You're going to see something that's going to catch your fucking attention that's going to blow your mind. I want this right here. I know this. This is a satellite. I'm going to take you to this, too. There's a video of it online. Anybody want to search this right now? Type this in. E-L-H-Y-S-A. Echo Lima Hotel Yankee Sierra Alpha 3. Type that in to YouTube right now to see if you can type that in dash satellite, and I guarantee you'll pull up the video for this fucking thing right now. But let's keep going through this so I can show this to you. You see this, people? What does that say? Mir. That's the Mir fucking module. That's the Mir space module that's supposed to be attached to the fucking ISS right now. That's the Mir space module. February 24th, 1997. Here goes another one. Mir. March 17th, 1997. Mir. Okay? I want you to see these things. All right? I want you to see these things. Let me take you to another one here. Because there's a... Let me... um, Hang on. Let me see. Here we go. Two more. Mir. February 18th, February 19th. 1999. Mir. It's the Mir space module, people, on a balloon. The Mir space module on a fucking balloon. 
The ISS does not exist complete the way they show it on television. Here goes another one. Mir on a balloon. What they are showing you of the space station is a fucking computer generated image. They are not showing you the complete fucking module put together flying at 17,000 miles an hour for fucking 15 years. Here you go. Look at this. Support Mir. They sent up a support balloon to sub resupply the Mir on a fucking balloon. On a balloon, people. Look at this. Orion. Orion payload. Look at here. In Marsat. You want to know where your satellite uh, phone communications come from? Fucking balloon. A balloon, people. A balloon. I'll supply this document to whoever wants it. Here we go. In Marisat test. Balloon. If you were to take time to search every single one of these flights to match it up with a particular rocket launch that they claim this fucking thing was on, I guarantee you, you will be able to compare it with this Swedish Isran Space Center balloon flight list. Balloon flight list. Balloons, people. That's your program. It's always been your program. Look at this. Mere short duration. Mere VLD. Me, you got two VLD. Look at here. More mere. This is in 2002, people. 2002. Every, for those in Europe, you ever heard of Inviasat? Look at Inviasat. Inviasat. These things are supposed to be testing the atmosphere for particulates and, you know, for pollution control. Balloons, people. You, you, you just, you can't come to any other conclusion. You don't have any other information to prove you were at the launch pad and you saw them put this fucking thing inside the nose cone of a rocket. You didn't see it. I don't give a fuck who you work for. You can work for NASA, you can work for the fucking Germans, you can work for the Russians. You did not see what you thought you saw going into a fucking nose cone of a capsule and with with a with an unedited fucking video stream and put on a launch pad and launched into the fucking sky on a rocket, on a fucking missile, a bomb. You didn't see that. Because it didn't fucking happen. Look at NASA. Why is NASA using why is NASA using the Swedish to launch a fucking balloon for them? Think about that. They're everywhere, people. They got relationships with all these fucking space agencies. They're carrying out the deception, the fraud, the hoax, the scam, the bullshit. It's all here. It's all here, people. I keep saying it's not what you know. It's what you can prove. You can talk about it all day long. You can claim this is your theory, this is your hypothesis. You ain't got no documentation to, to fucking back it up. You just want to show some bullshit video and you're not a videographer and you don't know how to do video analysis. You got to get the documentation. And here's the documentation right here. NASA, 2011, LED, ESO, high wind. Just check these out. Because I have. I've checked out all of this shit. NASA, 2003, 2013, Sunrise 2. Look at that. Balloon. Balloon, people. That's a complete list. It goes all the way to 2014. 2014, people. 2014. There you have it. There you have it, people. I don't know what else to tell you. I really don't know what else to tell you. Here goes another fucking balloon launch. Check this out. Just check this shit out. Check this shit out. Another satellite being launched from Antarctica. Check this out. You're going to love this one. That's Antarctica, people. Remember how we saw that circular launch pad? The bulldozer is smoothing out the, the ice and snow. Look at this. Just wait and see. Watch this. <laughs> mm. 
This is McMurdo Station in the background. McMurdo is right back here. They have line of sight to this airstrip. Just look at this. This is your billion trillion dollar fucking satellite program. A goddamn fucking balloon. A balloon, people. It goes fucking 20, 30 million dollars on a balloon. It's not inside a fucking rocket nose cone. There you go. <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! Yay! Yeah, now you want to know what NASA is spending all that fucking money for on helium? NASA has spent a shitload of money on helium. So you got to ask yourself. What the fuck is all that helium for, right? You think, okay, maybe it's for the vacuum chamber. They're doing all kinds of testing. No, bullshit. That fucking helium is so it's for their fucking balloon program. What else would you use fucking helium for? What would you use helium for? You use fucking helium to fucking float. It's at 18,000 feet right now. Come on, people. This, this, this common sense. This common fucking logic. Hey, the payload is now at a hundred and five thousand feet. Look at that, hundred and five thousand feet. Quite well, even with the naked eye. It's nice and well inflated now. So, based on the size of that balloon, now well, we're at about one hundred twenty thousand feet. Look at that. So these things got to get to at least 150, maybe 100, maybe maybe they can get to about 180,000 feet. But at nighttime, see this fucking thing. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see the satellite, period. You're just not going to fucking see it. So let's do this. Let's go to Lockheed Martin's website. I want to show you the capability of the U-2. So you guys can wrap your heads around this shit. You can wrap your heads around this, and then you can start putting together some crazy ass fucking videos based on what it is I'm I'm showing you. Let's go here. Uh, aircraft. So let's go to aircraft. Lockheed Martin's been doing this shit for a long time in NASA, man. Long, 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 long time. Long time, people. Very fucking long time. Close all these fucking files, man. Come on, man. Okay, so we're gonna go to aircraft. So let's go to the U2 Dragon Lady. Now I know I said some things before that there's a possibility they were projecting holographic images to make you think that you were seeing the ISS up there. I, like I said, my thinking, my analysis is dynamic. As I start finding more and more information, I change that shit. But I found out today 
that this new piece of thing technology put on the back of the YouTube that's for fucking satellite transmission and communications this your fucking satellite dish these things are flying up in the air acting as satellites okay acting as satellites people and let me see if I can go to the, the product card YouTube product card. Let's see. Let's go to that. Let's go to the YouTube product card. Okay, so here's your YouTube. I can tell you here right now, this is a new upgrade in addition. They've upgraded the satellite system. So instead of, they're still using balloons, okay? They're still using balloons. But as far as military advanced communications, topography, mapping, this platform, 33 of these are stationed around the world, 33 of them. Half of them are flown unmanned, means they, they can be remotely controlled on the ground like they control fucking Reaper and Predator and Global Hawk drones. Half of these can be flown without pilots inside of them. They can fly 24 hours. They can be refueled in the air at high altitude to do nonstop fucking flight ops. They've, they've got everything on board that you would need to do the same communications on the ground. 15 of these can be flown without pilots, unmanned. When I spoke to my professor who used to be a defense intelligence agency officer. He was in charge of the U-2 ISR program, Intelligence Surveillance and Crimes program. I asked him how many of these would be needed to cover the entire earth in a 24 hour period. He told me, you only need 10. You could map, you could cover the entire earth and your satellite photos that you guys see, satellite imagery, high altitude imagery that they claim is coming from the ISS, is coming from the fucking U-2. The U-2 is taking the high definition photographs and they're being presented as ISS fo footage. Don Pettit told you in the tyranny of the rocket equation, there ain't no fucking way humans ever left the fucking Earth. They ain't never left the fucking Earth in the space. This is it right here, period. Period. So let's look at this document. I want to blow this up for you guys here. So let's do this. It says here, and I want to go specific to the technical cap capabilities. Okay. Let's do this. It says here, look at the maximum cruise speed. Actually, no, the cruise speed is 475 miles an hour. Now, that's completely contradictory to what we have learned and been told with regard to high altitude aeronautics, that the higher you go, the faster you got to go to maintain aeronautic stability and control. But it seems here that the cruising speed for the U-2S is 475 miles an hour. That is nearly 100 miles an hour slower than a fucking commercial jet flying at 428,000 miles an hour. But again, there's less altitude at, at, there's less atmosphere at altitude. But this is where people get confused when you see all the videos. It says the ceiling is above 70,000 feet above 70,000 feet, people. The max altitude of U-2 is not 70,000. The ceiling is above 70,000. The range is greater than 6,000 fucking miles, which means if the cruising speed of U-2 is at 475 miles an hour and it can go above 70,000 feet, that means that there's no fucking way 
that means that there's definitely atmosphere. There's definitely a shitload of atmosphere that is breathable. You can operate in it above 70,000 feet. They know this because they were launching fucking balloons to 85,000 feet. And you can you use less fuel at 475 miles an hour above 70,000 feet. You don't see this fucking thing in the sky. You don't hear it. You don't see the, the vapor trails from the YouTube. This is the cruise speed. Maximum weight, 40,000 pounds. So would you think maybe possibly they could put some sort of hot advanced optical scope on this bad boy? Because the Hubble was 27,000 pounds. Maximum weight of this is 40,000 pounds. So how much advanced imagery and communication equipment you think you can put on this platform? A shitload of it. A shitload of it. It's twice the the is twice the mass of Hubble. Flying at above seventy thousand feet. Here it is, right here. And look at the price. Here's what's interesting to me: the coincidence, people. The Hubble, they claim, cost one point five billion dollars. The Hubble. One point five billion. Look what it says here: the recent one point five. Eight billion in system upgrades includes sensor upgrades, improves improves radar, multi-spectrum imaging and signals collection, sensors and data links, a new F-118 GE-101 engine, improves range and altitude, lowers operating costs and reduces weight by 12%, glass cockpit, new defensive suite, improves survivability against the la latest generation of missile and fighter threats. 1.58 billion, the Hubble. 1.58 billion. Sophia, 1.5 billion. What the fuck? That's like the magic fucking number, man. That's the magic number for a lot of this bullshit. 1.5 billion dollars is the number these government agencies are using. It's probably costing, it's probably costing half of this and the other half of going in the fucking pockets of your fucking Senate and congressional fucking representatives and their fucking contracting companies who are building this bullshit and telling you, oh no, it's all going up on a fucking rocket. It says here, reconnaissance and surveillance from the stratosphere. The stratosphere. Everything we know of, communications, tele, you know, uh, imagery, you name it, everything is stays within the stratosphere, which means we can't get fucking beyond the goddamn fucking thermosphere. We can't get there. We can't get there. This is our limitation. We can't go beyond this technological capability because we just can't get out there. We can't get there, people. When they say the U-2 flies at the edge of space, the edge of space, I'm sorry to tell you, 70,000, 85,000 feet is not the edge of fucking space. The edge means you're maybe within five to 10,000 fucking feet of the Carmen line, which is 328,000 motherfucking feet. How the hell could you be up in the YouTube, be on the edge of space? The edge of what space? You mean the next space, which is from the stratosphere is the mesosphere and then the thermosphere? Because maybe they're on the edge of the mesosphere. Or the thermos, they ain't close to the thermosphere because it's too goddamn hot up there. It's in excess of 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You honestly think that this aircraft will be able to fucking withstand those heat temperatures? Look at the SR-71. They tried to take it up there and look what happened to it. Fucking, you had fuel lines fucking melting because of the heat, the high heat and the speed. I do believe you have to fly faster the higher you go, but we can't do it. It's that simple. It's that simple. To me, it's that simple. It really is, people. To me, it's that fucking simple. That's the presentation, people. That's the fucking presentation. Uh. So, 
I'm open to questions. Did everybody see that? What did something happen? Did I lose people? Um, I don't know what to say. I'm open to any questions from anybody. Um, I'm just open. Ask me anything on chat. And uh, if you appreciated the presentation, can everybody hear me? Can you just give me a thumbs up that everybody saw that? Because I wasn't watching the watch channel, the watch page. I don't know what you saw, what you didn't saw. What you did? Everybody see all that? Balloon technology is far more advanced. Did everyone see the share screen? Just give me a thumbs up, people, so I know that everyone saw that. Because I wasn't, I had nobody helping me out to to tell me if I was, you could still hear me or whatever it may be. Okay. No glitches for me. Thumbs up. Okay. You guys appreciate that. You have any other questions? Because I'm going to tell you here right now. I think I've come probably to the pinnacle of all of my presentations. I think I've put it all together in one presentation for you for you guys. You have my you can look at all my videos. Some of you may like them, some of you may not like them, but you know what type of guy I am, what type of researcher I am. That's my model. It's not what you know. Is what you can prove. Okay? That's what it comes down to. That's definitely what it comes down to, people. Okay? You know what I'm about. You know what I'm about. And I think, I and, and, and to add to that, I want to say this. I want to say this to everybody. We all know that commercial airliners have a ceiling of 50,000 feet. 50,000 feet. Commercial planes. If you're flying a single engine turboprop, a dual engine turboprop, a single engine jet, double engine jet, multi engine jet, if you're a commercial pilot, you've got a ceiling of 50,000 feet. The optimal operating altitude is somewhere between 35,000 to 45,000 feet. But I came to this conclusion. I've heard stories that there's a 50 to 60,000 foot ceiling over Antarctica. Okay, over Antarctica specifically, specifically Antarctica. Okay, and it dawned on me why there was that that altitude, and I just figured it out putting this presentation together today. The reason why they can't have planes flying above fifty to sixty thousand feet over Antarctica is simple: the fucking balloons are coming down there. The balloons are literally being recovered down in Antarctica. And they have to, the planes can't capture these balloons and these satellites until they get to about 20 or 15,000 feet. So if you got a fucking plane flying above these top secret operations of satellite recovery, then that means that every passenger on that fucking plane is watching this plane snatch a fucking satellite out of the sky and take it back down to Antarctica. And then they all, the people on the plane are like, what the fuck did I just see? Because there is a company who actually, you can pay six to seven thousand dollars to fly over Antarctica on a Qantas, on a Qantas airline flight, and get this, they don't fly above thirty to 45,000 45, feet over Antarctica. They 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 are told they have to fly at ten thousand feet over Antarctica, ten thousand feet. Now that makes perfect sense. Because they don't want those fucking passengers seeing what the fuck is going on above 10,000 feet. I know now why commercial airlines are, cannot or forbidden to fly above 50,000 feet. And you just saw it for yourselves. They don't want commercial customers, commercial passengers looking out the side of their fucking window, watching a C-130 fly around recovering fucking satellites out of the sky in the stratosphere. They don't want people to see that because the, the, the lie, the lie that they want you to believe is that everything's going up on a fucking rocket. Everything. Everything. Everything's going up. The Chandra telescope is a fucking on a balloon and Justin, if you want to help me, let's fucking find it. I guarantee you, if it's up there right now, 
it's going to come back down soon, which means that it came down, it was captured, and they're going to service it and send it fucking right back up. See, here's the thing, people. I've been in the military, and there's redundancy in the military. Redundancy. When you set up an operation, when you build a piece of equipment, you don't just build one. You build two. Because if, the, if one of them fucking malfunctions, you need the backup. Or you need to, if it malfunctions, you need the backup to literally troubleshoot why it fucking malfunctioned using the backup. And then if that one goes down, you need a third one. You need a fourth one. We need a fifth one. So you want to know why these programs cost billions of dollars? Because they actually manufactured maybe a half dozen of them that get launched from several different locations around the world. So when you're looking at what you think is the real-time view of ISS moving around the fucking planet right now, you're looking at several different versions of the ISS floating around. Period. Period. That's what you're looking at. They've got multiple assets up in the sky floating around on fucking balloons. Now, I want to go back to an issue. And this is the issue I want to go back to. The ISS. I'm going to pull that up. No, here's the thing. You guys can do it. I want you to go to the European Space Agency site or just type in track the ISS. And there are several sites that are tracking the ISS. Okay? Several sites tracking the ISS. Let me see if I can pull it up here for you guys. I'm going to do another share screen so that you guys can see this because I actually have it on one platform that you guys can actually see. And it's important to see this because it gives you a it will give you a complete view of what the fuck is really going on up in the sky all right and let me see this right here let me see this I'm gonna do another share screen with you guys so you can see this because it's very important for you to see it I, I pulled it up yesterday and it was a very 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 good tool that I captured and um, I'm going to pull this up for you guys so you can see this. Now, uh, let me see. Let me know when you guys can see this. I'm going to turn off the visor. So here we go. These are, and I can't make this fucking thing bigger either. There we go. There we go. Okay. So if you're looking at this, here's the deal. If you can see this, this is the ISS. Okay? Here's Hubble. Here's Hubble. Now I want you guys to notice something. Can everybody see this? Can everybody see this? Could you see that map page I was showing? Thumbs up. I just need a couple of thumbs up. That's all. A couple of thumbs up. That's it. All right. Let me show. Let me show this to you guys. If you look at this, here, here, here's what they claim to be the Hubble. Okay. The Hubble. They claim the Hubble is at 541 fucking miles. All right. That's what they said. 500 and it's traveling at 27,323 fucking miles an hour. That's what they say. All right. That's what they say. And it's at 541 miles. The ISS, they're claiming the ISS is at 402 miles. Okay. 402 miles. No, no, no. My mistake, people. Let me let me let me digress. Let me retract from that. My mistake. If if I'm right on this, if I'm right on this and I need somebody to help me help correct me. They say the distance is 1036 kilometers. But see, I don't believe that. I'm going to tell you why I don't believe that. And this is the reason why. I think this is 541,000 feet. This is what I think. 
I think this is 5,400, five, I think this is 541,000 feet. Okay, feet, feet, that's the Hubble, 541,000 feet. I think the ISS is at 402,000 feet. And the reason why I say I think the ISS is at 4, 402,000 feet is because every shuttle launch I've ever seen, the telemetry data, the shuttle detaches from the main fuel tank at around 345,000, 350,000 feet. And it, now this data makes sense to me. It's not 508 fucking kilometers. It's four, well, yeah, well that's the, the, the comparison. I think it's at 402,000 feet above the surface of the Earth. That's where ISS really is. And Hubble is about 100 miles away from it. But if you notice, right, these fuckers, if, 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 we, if this were timed correctly, the ISS would, should come within range of Hubble. You guys want this website address? It's satview.org. Satview.org. Okay? Satview.org. Tracking satellites. Use this platform. Use this platform based on the data that I provided. Satview.org. Look what the ISS is. Now I want you guys to notice something, people. You notice how the elliptical orbits they come back down to Antarctica. You notice this? You notice how they all slope back down to Antarctica? Some of them, nothing goes up here. Nothing goes where Chris talked about called the dew, the dew line, the distant early warning line up in this area here. Nothing. Nothing's going up here. Here's Antarctica, all down here. Everything is taking that loop. Everything is getting within range of a C-130 to fly off the coast of Antarctica, capture it when it's down here. See, this is a, this is a National Oceanic um, Atmospheric Observatory satellite. NOAA, NOAA, uh, one. It goes one right here. So every time a satellite gets within range of Antarctica, they'll send something out to check to see how it's doing, what its health is like. Now this is fucking strange. Why is there a satellite named ISIS and one named ISS? Isn't ISIS a fucking terrorist group? ISIS is a terrorist group. They got a satellite named after it. And then you got the ISS. Here's the ISS. There you go, people. Here's the ISS. Here's ISIS. ISIS. ISS. ISIS. ISS. You got two NOAA satellites. One up top, one down below, near, Aust near Australia, New Zealand. You got those aircraft flying off the coast. Boom, let's go get this bad boy. Let's go get this bad boy. Let's go get Tiango. This is a Chinese satellite. They ain't going to go snatch this bad boy. I think they're snatching fucking people's shit out of And you see, the U.S. actually complained about Russia developing a space defense capability. Space defense capability? I'm going to tell you what they're complaining about. The U.S. is complaining about what the U... The U.S. is complaining, of, complaining about what Russia is doing because the U.S. did it back in the fucking 50s. They did the same fucking thing back in the 50s. They were snatching Russian shit out of the sky, so the Russians are now snatching U.S. shit out of the sky. That's just how it works. They're snatching their shit out of the air with fucking planes. When you hear about Russian B-2 bombers flying over the Arctic and coming within you know, distance of the U.S. coastline, you best believe this. the Russians are out snatching shit out of the fucking North American skies using the B-52, using the Russian bombers because the Russian bombers are capable of snatching large, massive payloads out of the sky. They're capable of doing it. You saw it for yourself, people. You saw it for yourself. It's that simple. 
It's that simple. It's that simple, people. It doesn't get any fucking complicated than that. The whole entire satellite program is not on a fucking rocket. It's not on a rocket. Period. Period. And like my saying goes, you guys know my saying. What can you prove, huh? Nothing. Where's your evidence, huh? That's my saying. What can you prove? What can you prove? I don't know what to tell you, people. Don't know what to tell you. It's, it's amazing. I don't know how anybody out there can be talking about anything else other than the evidence I showed you what exists in Antarctica, the satellite program, the ISS. You know now how the ISS could exist. You know now how the ISS can exist. It's that simple. The ISS is not there, is not up in the sky as an entire Lego land constructed 100 yard long, 50 yard wide fucking contraption. It is up there. You saw it for yourself. It is up there in its individual modules. Think about this, people. I think that when Scott Kelly and Mishka, that Russian astronaut who were up there for a year, I think that Scott Kelly and that astronaut Mishka were in a separate module by themselves, floating on a balloon for one year. I think that they were resupplied with additional helium and, and replacement balloons so that they could stay up there. I think that when Scott Kelly and Mishka came in contact with other astronauts from resupply missions. I think that somehow those modules came together and docked safely. They connected and then you see them together. But whenever they shoot video, whenever NASA shoots video, you never see the whole fucking crew at one fucking time. You never see them all at one time. There are times where you have seen them all at one time, but I think there, I think that there's modules put together. They have this thing they call parking orbit. I think that there's a larger vehicle up there floating around where they all can co-mingle and then they get the, then they jump out into their separate modules and float around the fucking earth on balloons. You never see them all together. There's no fucking way something of that mass and size can fly at 17,000 miles an hour for 15 fucking years and drop and rise in altitude somewhere between two to three fucking miles in a fucking day. Because once it dropped in altitude, you gotta put a lot of fucking effort in making sure that thing gets back up to where it does. And you saw the document I showed you where they can get a balloon, they got a balloon in 1950 to 85,000 feet, and then at nighttime, when the, cooler, when the air cools down, the balloon drops 20,000 feet. So you tell me how something the size of a fucking football field could drop 20,000 fucking feet during the nighttime and then somehow float the fucking back up where it was when it started. That's, based on the laws of physics, that's fucking impossible. It's fucking impossible. All of you who are watching right now, all of you who are listening, you have my unfeathered permission to share this video, share this hangout. You can edit it, whatever the fuck you want to do with it. But please, show some professional re reciprocity. Show some professional reciprocity and give me the fucking credit. Because there ain't nobody out there doing the shit that I'm doing. There are some of people out there really doing the shit, but you guys see how I'm putting it together. It ain't fucking fancy. 
it ain't high speed, it ain't elaborate, it ain't government funded. I ain't financing shit. I'm doing this shit in my spare time, but I love what I do. The truth is so precious that she must be guarded by a bodyguard of lies. And my goal, my goal and my ambition is to assassinate those fucking bodyguards to kidnap the truth. Because like Winston Churchill said, the truth is so precious, she must be attended by a bodyguard of lies. And I'm slowly taking these motherfuckers out like ninjas. I'm taking out these fucking lies like ninjas. And eventually, I'm going to get a hold of the truth and she's going to say, where have you been? When, why did it take you so long to rescue me? You're all welcome to share this content. Please do email me. I put a lot of links in the description section. If you need access to documents, do the search, man. Find the documents. They're there. They're out there. They're out there. They are out there. Put together your own content, but please do. Show some professional reciprocity. Give me the credit. I'm not looking to be famous. And to be honest with you people, I don't give a fuck how many subscribers I got, how many viewers I got. Because one of you will be motivated enough to say, hey, everybody pay attention. This shit this guy put out is incredible. I, I my, my, my channel's not monetized, people. I, I don't care about getting paid for this shit. It's peanuts. This shit ain't even enough money to buy my son diapers. I do it from straight passion, straight passion. And I do my homework. And it's my motto. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Anybody come at you telling you, ah, it's all bullshit, you don't know what you're talking about, then fuck, okay, then don't do the talking. Let the documentation do the fucking talking for you. Let the documents talk. Because these people who are trolling and saying, hey, you don't know what you're talking about, you misinterpreting the documentation, then fine. Share the documentation with them and let them fucking read it and then have a conversation with them saying, okay, you read the documentation, what do you think? And see what they say. See how they try to distort the documentation that they believe in because they believe in the government agency who put it out. This shit ain't real, people. None of this shit, all the shit you see on TV that's being put out for decades, this shit is all fucking smoke and mirrors. I just showed you. I want to wish you guys all the best. I really appreciate the people who've been viewing and listening and commenting. Again, please feel free to email me at rm. Basano, B-A-S-S-A-N-O, at gmail.com. Or send me something privately. You want to discuss anything with me, feel free. I'm open. I don't know everything, but I know more than most. I can talk about everything. And if I don't know the answer, give me 24 hours, I'll have the answer for you. I'll have the answer for you. I'm about lifelong fucking knowledge, understanding, comprehension, and truth. And if I don't know something and I need to know it, I'm going to learn it. Very, real fucking fast. Real fast. None of my fucking data can be fucked with because it comes from the source that generated. I go to the genesis of the information. So please, feel free, people. Have a free for all. Edit your asses off with any video you want to download from my channel. For those who have access to my secure cloud, feel free. There's documents in there I haven't even fucking used in my presentations. So be my guest and download that shit. Use it at your own free will, okay, your own leisure. But again, give credit to where credit's due. I'm not looking to lead this shit. I'm not looking to be in the spotlight, the limelight, you know, have people, you know, say, hey, this guy should be this. I, I, I just don't. I don't care about the subscribers. I don't care about any of that shit. You know, you guys know yourselves when you look at see how many people are subscribed to me. Believe me when I tell you 10 times that amount of people. Videos, a lot of them don't want to subscribe just because they don't feel like it. And I don't I don't have a problem with that. So I don't want you to get discouraged by the numbers you see on my channel thinking they don't like this guy for some whatever reason. So maybe I should stay away from him. No, 
believe me, you see me post some new shit, you know it's some good shit. And I welcome you. You are open to come into my house. When I say my house, I'm talking about my channel. You can come into my house, knock on the door and says, hey, Robert, can I use this? Yeah, sure. Hey, go be my guest. Because I had somebody use my shit regarding the, the, the construct of the earth. The video was titled the, the equipotential ellipse. The earth is an equipotential ellipsoid. And the guy promoted the fucking information, presenting it like I was saying the fucking entire earth is flat. And I had to copyright strike that motherfucker. I don't fucking believe the entire fucking earth is flat. It's an egg-shaped ellipsoid undergoing flattening with a flat plane surface in the middle with, with level waters. That's my belief. I'm not no fucking flat earther. Because a flat earther can't even define what the fuck they mean when they say flat earth. They better say the ground they fucking walking on. Because the rest of the system above them ain't fucking flat. It's some sort of weird ass fucking concoction that we still trying to figure out what it is. But they have an idea that is some sort of ellipsoid that is undergoing flattening, meaning the pressure is increasing. And there's more. The land is is expanding. There's more land out there. It has to be. There has. There's definitely fucking more land out there. And I want to know where the fuck it is, because I think when people die, when you leave the physical body that you're in right now, I ain't, I don't think there's a fucking heaven. I think these people's spirits are being transferred into some other dimension outside of the realm we call our environment into maybe one of these land masses, which may be other fucking countries and different civilizations of peoples. I really believe that now. There's a lot more land out there. And it's, it's being kept out of reach. It's being kept out of knowledge from us. Our entire fucking map we know of is wrong, wrong. There's landmass missing, missing. I think that's what they're hiding with the whole denial of the flat earth. They're denying that there's a shitload of more land out there and the rich and these governments are trying to get it for themselves and leave us here to try to kill each other. That shit ain't gonna happen on my watch. It ain't gonna happen. I'm gonna find this fucking place. And if it happens to be an island just for us, okay, we gonna name it the Republic of fucking Flat Earth. <laughs> That'll be our, we'll have our own defense force, every fucking thing. Be fruitful, people. Multiply this data, put it out there. I wanna thank all of you, man. I'm done with this, this presentation. Again, feel free. I got Skype as well. You can Skype me at r.m.basano on Skype. We can have a free-for-all and talk. I don't care who you are, but if you try to say some crazy shit to me and telling me, you know, and being a troll, I'm going to tell you here right now, it ain't going to last long. So be good to each other, people. Take care, and I thank you guys for viewing. Peace out, man. Again, it's not what you know. It's what you can prove. Have a great Sunday.